Well, we're standing here this evening in the most beautiful of settings uh, with these beautiful honey-coloured limestone buildings in a UNESCO heritage site just moments from the Mediterranean. But we're here to discuss the most ugly of things, the brutal assassination of a journalist for doing her job, for speaking truth to power and for treading on some very sensitive, powerful toes. And make no mistake, today we're marking six and a half years since Daphne was killed for all of those things. Since she was murdered because she was a journalist, because she spoke out and refused to be silenced. Six and a half years, 78 months that we mark today. Now, I never had the privilege of meeting Daphne, but in the last six and a half years, I've got to learn about her from her incredible family, many of whom are here this evening. And I've got to know her through her brave investigative reporting, her witty writing, her searing no-nonsense, vital writing, uncovering corruption, putting her head above the parapet when many others did not. She was, as you know, a remarkable, courageous, groundbreaking, brilliant journalist. The first woman to write a political column in Malta, uh, the first to write in her own name, not anonymously, and she broke almost every major story since 1988. And just to cast your mind back to 1988, she was aged only 24 at the time. It's the year when her youngest son, Paul, was born. She was a mother of three very young boys. And at a time when many of us find it difficult to get out of bed in the morning and to keep food on the table and to keep the show on the road, she was Malta's conscience, doing her brilliant journalism at a time when she was under tremendous personal pressure. And it's also important to remember that she was incredibly prolific. If you look back at her blog, you'll see she produced multiple blogs at all hours of the day and the night. We all got the same 24 hours in a day. I can tell you, Daphne eked out every single minute and every single second and put it to the best possible use. Now, we know she was a courageous woman, a brilliant journalist, using her skills to speak truth to power. We know she served the public good, believing in the potential for journalism to build a more just society and to reshape Malta's future. But I also learn about her from reviewing the three decades of threats that she received simply for doing her job and for holding the powerful to account. Arson attacks on her home, attempts to cut off her income, the freezing of her bank accounts, dozens of libel suits brought by the powerful, by ministers, by business people, vile misogynistic attacks online, critics in the street calling her a witch. Many of you will remember that Matthew, her son, testified in 2019 saying, it feels like they're trying to fry me alive because of what she was experiencing, a battle on all fronts. Now in some ways, what happened in October 2017 on that day was a logical, horrific extension of many other ways the powerful had attempted to silence her for three decades. And it's important to say that to many, what happened in October 2017 was presented as if it was a bolt from the blue, a surprise, a shock, entirely unpredictable. You look at the quotes around the world that greeted that terrible news in October 2017. But in truth, this was not a bolt from the blue. This was not a surprise. This was a predictable, preventable death. And Malta and the world should have seen it coming. And Daphne herself spelled out the risks to her. Ten days before her death, she gave an interview to the Council of Europe describing in detail the threats that she faced. Uh, she said in that interview, they've made me into a national scapegoat, comparing herself to the women persecuted in the 17th century, portrayed in Arthur Miller's play, The Crucible. 
She set out, in her own words, the danger she was in 10 days beforehand, and 10 days later, she was brutally assassinated. This was, make no mistake, a preventable death. It followed years of state-sanctioned harassment. It took place in a culture of total impunity. The risks were not only known to the state and ignored, the state fanned the flames of impunity. And of course, the killing also came in a culture of total impunity in relation to the subject matter of much of her reporting, rampant corruption. Now, that, of course, was 2017, over six years ago. And many of you will know that in August 2021, the independent public inquiry in Malta, following brilliant work by Therese and her team, published its detailed 437-page report. And the report found that the Maltese state must shoulder responsibility for her death. It's a damning report, concluding a culture of impunity was created from the highest echelons of power within the Castile, and singled out for particular criticism, rightly, is former Prime Minister Joseph Muscat. Singled out as identifying as enabling this culture of impunity, and his entire cabinet was found to be collectively responsible for their inaction in the lead up to the assassination. Again, not a surprise in many ways, because you look back at the words of the family within the first few days and weeks in 2017. Within weeks of the death, Matthew accused the state and Muscat of being complicit in her killing, writing, a culture of impunity has been allowed to flourish by the government in Malta. It's a little comfort for the prime minister of this country to say that he will not rest until the perpetrators are found, when he heads a government that encouraged that same impunity. If the institutions were already working, there would be no assassination to investigate. My brothers and I would still have a mother. And we now know from the report that the public inquiry found that the family was right all along. Essentially, what we have here is the government creating a favorable climate for anyone seeking to eliminate Daphne to do so with a minimum of consequences, giving a green light to attacks upon a journalist for doing their job, for speaking truth to power. Now, I want to turn to what's happened in the six and a half years since. And understandably, we often focus on what hasn't happened, uh, the things which should have happened and didn't, the outrageous foot dragging and delaying, the fact that the trial process has yet to conclude, the fact that the recommendations of the public inquiry so hard fought have yet to be implemented, the radio silence to Republica's call for Keith Skembri and Silvio Valletta to be prosecuted as suspects for leaking sensitive information about the murder investigation. Uh, but I want to focus in my speech on some of the huge amounts of positive things that have happened in the six and a half years since Daphne's death. There have been many hugely powerful achievements which you may never have thought possible six and a half years ago, and I just want to highlight three in particular. The first is a flourishing civil society embodied by what we're seeing here this evening. The work of Republica and Occupy Justice has been exceptional. And I want to pay tribute to the absolutely brilliant work of the foundation which now bears Daphne's name. Now we're standing here, of course, beside the Great Siege Monument, used as a makeshift memorial to Daphne. But many of you in the crowd will remember that for months, indeed years, the tributes that were placed at this memorial every single day were removed on a daily basis by government employees. And then in 2020, hugely significant court decision finding that the then Minister for Justice, Owen Benici's orders to repeatedly clear the memorial were a violation of protesters' right to freedom of expression. And this very memorial where we're standing today has become a testament not only to Daphne herself and her incredible, brilliant, vitally important work, but also to the determination of all of you who wish to remember her, to mark her legacy, 
and most importantly, to secure change. So civil society is the first one. Second I want to point to is legal progress in Malta. There have been many seismic wins and achievements in the last six and a half years, from that decision about the protest memorial to last week's 155-page damning findings about institutional failures in the murder investigation. And most importantly, the public inquiry itself. I entirely agree with the concerns about the public inquiry recommendations not yet being fully implemented. But the public inquiry itself has fundamentally shifted the dial. It was a huge fight to secure it, a fight no bereaved family should ever have gone through. But it was a fight that they won. Public inquiry was achieved, an innovative process to examine whether Daphne's death was preventable and the wider issues of institutional failures and impunity. And this is now a framework which can be used for justice in other cases and a lasting legacy. So more needs to be done, but a huge amount has been achieved. <laughs> and the third example I want to give is on the international stage, international progress in protecting journalists' rights. Every single day in my work, I see Daphne's legacy. I see it in micro ways in individual cases, and I see it in macro ways. The world is changing because of the work that's being done by people like you here in Daphne's name. So in micro ways, in micro ways, in individual cases, every single day, I see how authorities now take far more seriously the online abuse of women journalists. Journalists like my client, Maria Ressa in the Philippines, or Iranian journalists threatened with death by the long arm of the Iranian state threatening to kill them in their homes and in their workplaces in London, in Washington DC, in Paris. Today, in other cases entirely unconnected to Malta, I've seen Daphne's name mentioned by others that I'm in co correspondence with three times. And that's not a surprise because Daphne's legacy means that there is now a vital sense of urgency about journalist safety and protection of journalists which was not there before. So those people who were glib and thought this was a bolt from the blue and unexpected, look at the world through a different light, thanks to the work of people like you in places like this. <laughs> and also, of course, we see Daphne's legacy in macro ways, in the way the rule of law is valued in the Council of Europe in a way which, frankly, I do not think it was before. And even today, with the EU's anti-SLAPP directive, Daphne's law becoming official. A huge achievement. Now, some of you may have heard that quote, most people overestimate what they can do in one year and underestimate what they can do in 10 years, often attributed to Bill Gates, but actually the most probable source is a Stanford computer scientist in the 1960s, Roy Amara. And it's true. Almost universally, we tend to overestimate what can happen in the short term, underestimate what can happen and what we can achieve in the long term. So my core message today is that in the short term, it's easy and understandable that people feel hopeless and demotivated and that the road ahead feels difficult and that the tasks ahead feel impossible. But these are huge achievements in the space of six and a half years. We've got to remember change is not linear, a simple line, a trajectory which is always positive and always moving upwards in a simple line. There are peaks and troughs. What has been achieved already is monumental and don't let things like the judgment yesterday put you off. Change is gradual and slow, but it's happening and it's going overall in the right direction. And there's much more to do, much, much more to do. We must do it together. We must remember, like Daphne, there's 24 hours in the day We've got to eke out every single second and use it for good and for change. Now, I want to end just with two quotes from people I admire greatly. It won't surprise you to know that the first of those is Daphne Caruana Galizia herself. It's her own words from a blog on the 5th of June 2017, headed, Right and Wrong is Not a Popularity Contest. And she wrote, I know you don't have to tell me it's the reason I do it. 
that this website has over the last four years become a gathering post, a rallying point for decent people who feel frightened and threatened at the rise, growth and spread of amorality, not by any means the same thing as immorality. I know why you come here because lots of you tell me, but I knew it instinctively even before you did. You come here to feel normal in a sea of insanity where the crowd cheers the Commissioner of Police for failing to take action against a corrupt Cabinet Minister and the Prime Minister's Chief of Staff, where supporters of the party in power celebrate and have their pictures taken on the steps of a bank which launders money for Azerbaijan's ruling elite because it's linked to politicians they support, where even educated people who've had all the advantages in life vote a corrupt political power party into power for the narrow reason that they're renting out flats to buyers of Maltese citizenship who never set foot in them. So Daphne described her blog being a rallying point, a gathering post. Well, now we need to make this a new rallying point and gathering post, a place to feel normal in a sea of insanity, a place to stand up for what is right. And my final quote is from a man from another predominantly Catholic island off the coast of Europe, um, although his name, although Irish, is a little easier to spell and say than mine, Seamus Heaney, the Nobel, Peace, uh, the Nobel Prize winning poet. And in the Cura Troy, a version of a play by Sophocles, he wrote this. History says, don't hope on this side of the grave, but then once in a lifetime, the longed for tidal wave of justice can rise up and hope and history rhyme. So hope for a great sea change on the far side of revenge. Believe that further shore is reachable from here. Believe in miracles and cures and healing wells. Now Heaney was speaking about that relationship between history and hope, learning from the past, using it to ensure securing change for the future. And he was highlighting those rare moments once in a lifetime when a long-awaited tidal wave of justice emerges. Now, he was writing about the Good Friday Agreement and the Northern Irish peace process, but his words echo here in this beautiful place, in this gathering post, in this rallying place. Daphne should never have been killed. She should still be here with us, speaking truth to power, writing her brilliant blog, probably 27 entries a day, on previous history. It's frankly a disgrace that she was taken from her family, taken from Malta, taken from the world. But tonight I ask us to remember that her death has been a catalyst for huge change in Malta and for journalist safety worldwide. Don't ever forget what you've achieved already. Standing at this rallying point, believe in miracles, and cures and healing wells. A further shore is reachable from here. Thank you.